Good morning, church. Mary and Greg and I are here delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through this Sabbath school lesson. Greg, would you pray for God's blessings on this morning's study? It would be my honor. Let's bow our heads. O oh, gracious, kind, and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful Sabbath morning. Lord, we ask and pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be upon each of us and upon the listeners and viewers who are participating with us. May you speak through each of us here to teach your word and to focus on the principles. So much, Greg. Thank you. You know, this is uh, Sabbath school lesson number 13 of the second quarter. This is the last lesson. And what a quarter this has been. I have been incredibly blessed by the study of these lessons, and I'm sure that you've also been. This week's Sabbath school lesson, the last of the quarter, is entitled Israel in Egypt. And of course, who's Israel? Jacob. So Jacob is in Egypt. And yes, we are going to study all the implication thereof. The memory text for this week's lesson is found in Genesis chapter 47, verses 27. And so it says, So Israel, Jacob, dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Geshen. And they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Now, Geshem is in Egypt. And it is inter interesting that Jacob and his family, through this particular verse, have had great possessions and grew and multiply exceedingly. So I'm going to make a statement here which I think is very relevant. This verse, this begun the fulfillment of the promise made by God to Jacob in Beersheba. When Jacob was with God in Beersheba, God said to him, I am God, the God of your father, Jacob. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. Genesis 46.3. So here's a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. This week's Sabbath School lesson covers the last years of Jacob and Joseph together. In Genesis chapter 46 and 47, we see Jacob leave Canaan, the promised land, in order to settle in Egypt. Jacob welcomes the good news that Joseph is alive. Him and his family leave Canaan with hope and the assurance that they will no longer be hungry and that they will be reunited as a family. Really, the chosen family. God's chosen family at that. Jacob's departure to Egypt is very similar to Abraham's departure to Egypt, his grandfather. They both leave Canaan and settle in Egypt because of famine. Jacob has no desire to stay in Egypt permanently. Jacob believes in the promise God made to him, and so the prospect of return to the promised land still looms large in the background. The whole clan of Jacob is now in exile in Egypt. Genesis chapter 46, verses 27, and I'm not going to read that, tells us that the clan of Jacob, which includes Jacob and Joseph, Joseph's two sons, and the other sons of Jacob is made up of 70 people. This is the core of the nation God is preparing, that God is building. Unfortunately, however, Genesis chapter 49 tells us that Jacob dies in Egypt. In fact, the last two chapters of Genesis takes us to the end of the patriarchal period with the deaths of both Jacob and Joseph. These last chapters of the book of Genesis seem to describe a coffin 
in Egypt. The history of salvation seems to have no happy ending when one looks at those particular uh, verses. And yet these last chapters of Genesis provides significant signs of evidence of hope. It testifies hope. You see, in this Egyptian setting, the profile of Israel as God's people is being shaped and developed. And as we read in Genesis chapter 50, the prospect of the promised land still looms large in the background. And so, in preparation toward the redemptive future and the anticipated return to the promised land, we see Jacob blessing Pharaoh. That's in chapter 47. Thus fulfills partially the Abrahamic promise that Israel will be a blessing to the nation. And that you find in Genesis chapter 12, verses 3, where it says, I will bless those who bless you, God talking to Abraham, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, says the Lord. We see Jacob blessing Jacob's sons. We see Jacob blessing his own sons and making impressive predictions concerning each one of them. We see Jacob predicting the future of what will become the 12 tribes of Israel and the future coming of the Messiah, the one who will save Israel and the nations. In fact, the Israel, uh, the, the, the fact that Israel dwells in, in, in exile in Egypt he is strange, but it is tension, but it is full of hope of the promise of the land. And though the book of Genesis itself ends with the children of Israel in Egypt, some of the last words of Joseph point to another place. Here's what Joseph says in Genesis chapter 50, verses 24, and you're going to hear that from Greg as well. I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of the land of the land of which he swore to Abraham to Isaac and to uh, and to and, and of course to to uh, Jacob Joseph knows that death is near he does not simply anticipate his future death he thinks of the future of the exodus and the return to the promised land as we read in Genesis chapter, as we read in, in, in Genesis chapter 50, verses 24, Joseph bases his hope in God's promise, a promise made under oath to Abraham, Isaac, and his father Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, our patriarchs, also anticipate the return to the promised land in terms that echo the very first words of Genesis found in the first two chapters, an, intro an introduction to a new creation and the planting of a brand new Garden of Eden. So Mary, Jacob agrees to come to Egypt. How significant is this decision? Mm, it's quite significant. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. So this lesson covers Genesis 46, the entire chapter. In the previous chapter, we learned that Jacob revealed himself to his brothers. Pharaoh then invites his brothers to go back, get their families, and move them to Egypt. Jacob learns the truth about Joseph, that he's alive, and he determines to go to him. So why would Jacob leave Canaan. He's 130 years old at this point. The trip is over 200 miles. That's a long trip for an elderly man with his entire clan. What's his motivation? Well, as Victor had mentioned earlier, they are escaping the severe famine, and it is a very severe famine. Want and starvation were staring them in the face. And secondly, he gets to see Joseph. So the families with their flocks, their herds, and their numerous attendants depart on their journey. Now we'll pick up the story. 
Let's read Genesis 46, 1 through 4. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. So Ellen White expands on these verses in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 232. When they came to Beersheba, the patriarch offered grateful sacrifices and entreated the Lord to grant them an assurance that he would go with them. So Beersheba was the same place where back in chapter 26, God had appeared to Isaac when he came back from Egypt. And Isaac dug a well and found water. Isaac built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, many years later, Jacob calls upon the Lord, and the Lord answers him in a dream at night. And how does God respond? Well, first, he calls his name twice. He's getting his attention. God desires Jacob and reassures Jacob of his divinity. He is the God of his father. Thirdly, he tells him, do not be afraid to go to Egypt. And lastly, he ends with a promise, and that promise has many parts to it. First is in Egypt, he will make him a great nation. He repeats the same promise made to Abram when he left Ur of the Chaldees to the promised land. Secondly, he promises that he will go with him to Egypt. Thirdly, God will bring him back to the promised land and that Joseph would be there with him at his death. As we continue studying Genesis 46, verses 5 to 7, reads, Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father, Jacob, their little ones, and their wives in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. So they took their livestock and their goods, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and went to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him his sons and his sons' sons, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. Verses 8 to 27 contain a comprehensive list of Jacob's wives, his sons, and his daughters. This recalls God's promise to Abraham that he would be fruitful even when he was still childless. Sixty-six family members departed from Canaan. If you count Jacob, Joseph, and Joseph's two sons, a total of 70 Israelites started a nation within another nation that would grow to more than 2 million people by the Exodus. It's all Israel that goes down to Egypt. Verses 28 to 34 recounts Israel's arrival in Egypt. As we read in verses 28 and 29, Then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Jacob sent Judah ahead to meet Joseph and direct the family to their new home, which was in the best of the land, the country of Goshen. Then father and son reunite after 22 long years. Joseph rode in his chariot to Goshen. And in Patriarchs and Prophets, we read, the splendor of his surroundings and the dignity of his position were alike forgotten. One thought alone filled his mind, one longing thrilled his heart as he beheld the travelers approaching, the love whose yearnings had for so many long years been repressed would no longer be controlled. He sprang from his chariot and hastened forward to bid his father welcome. And he fell on his neck and wept 
a good while. The chapter ends with Joseph directing his brothers what to say when they are presented before Pharaoh. Verses 34 and 35 read, So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? That you shall say, Your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth, even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. And we'll cover this a little more in the next section. So in conclusion, what is the significance of Jacob's departure to Egypt? Why would God allow them to leave Canaan? Isn't this the promised land? Couldn't God have provided for them during the famine? We get a little more insight from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 232. The promise had been given to Abraham of a posterity numberless as the stars, but as yet the chosen people had increased but slowly. And the land of Canaan now offered no field for the development of such a nation as had been foretold. It was in the possession of powerful heathen tribes that were not to be disposed until the fourth generation. If the descendants of Israel were here to become a numerous people, they must either drive out the inhabitants of the land or disperse themselves among them. The former, driving them out of the land, according to the divine arrangement, they could not do. And should they mingle with the Canaanites, they would be in danger of being seduced into idolatry. Egypt, however, offered the conditions necessary to the fulfillment of the divine purpose. A section of country well watered and fertile was open to them there, affording every advantage for their speedy increase and the antipathy they must encounter in Egypt on account of their occupation, for every shepherd was an abomination unto the Egyptians, would enable them to remain a distinct and separate people and would thus serve to shut them out from participation in the idolatry of Egypt. We need to learn that sometimes God allows apparent difficulties or famines in our lives However, he's prepared the conditions necessary to the fulfillment of the divine purposes for our lives and will lead us to a place where we can flourish. We just need to trust him. When we see ourselves in such situations, we need to remember Jacob's example and first express our gratitude to God, entreat him to go with us and ask him to guide us. Thank you, Mary. You know, Mary and Greg, when I, when I look at this incredible journey, you, you know, I think in terms of the fact that there was no question that he lived by faith. He had Amen. to trust God. Amen. He had to believe God. And even yes. though he was going exactly to the wrong place, it was the right place for the evolution of a nation that God was preparing. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Now, Jacob settles in Egypt, Greg. Yes. Unpack that for us. Yeah, the, the title of Monday's lesson, as Victor had just mentioned, is Jacob Settles in Egypt. And the title, it's actually a little bit more than that, and you'll see as we go through this. But I want you to keep in mind, we're really going to be looking at what the spiritual truths and principles we can learn from the verses that we're going to read that concern Jacob and Joseph and um, and his brothers. So let's take a look at this. And first of all, let me also say good morning and happy Sabbath to you. So we know that um, Jacob has mourned deeply, as Mary and Victor had mentioned before, that Jacob has mourned very, very deeply for the presumed loss of his son Joseph for a long time. And then Jacob is told by his brothers that his beloved son Joseph is alive in Egypt, and he's desperately wants to go see Joseph before he himself dies. And so once again, if there's any hesitation at all that was going on within Jacob, as far as, well, he knew that the famine was going on, but go to Egypt, that must have been something that settled in the back of his mind. Because as Mary had mentioned in, in the previous lesson, God spoke directly again to Jacob 
through a vision at night. And again, we're just going to go through those verses again because we think it's very important for us to understand this. That there's a very important spiritual lesson to be learned here. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear and go down to Egypt for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. So the key spiritual lesson to be learned there. And I think Jacob learned this in his walk with the Lord is to wait patiently on the Lord. And when the Lord gives direction, then we take it. That's so important for us to understand as Christians is to wait patiently for the Lord. But when he gives us direction, we need to follow his direction. He's with us. And that's what he was telling Jacob. Now, later in chapter 46, Jacob and his family, as Mary had mentioned, including uh, Joseph's brothers, are finally reunited in Goshen, as we had heard. Then Joseph offers wise counsel to his brothers before they're to meet and to be questioned by Pharaoh. And we look at Genesis 46, verses 31 through 34. So I'm going to read this because this is going to build a little bit here. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds for their occupation has been to feed the livestock and they have brought their flocks, their herds and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? That you shall say your servant's occupation has been with the livestock from our youth even till now, both we and also our fathers. This is so important here. It's a very important principle that you may dwell in the land of Goshen for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So we have to understand here What's going on? What is the spiritual principle that we're looking at? We're going to follow this a little bit further and then we'll really address those. So continuing forward and for the rest of the day's lesson, we're going to be centered on Genesis 47 verses 1 through 10. But let's begin by reading verses 1 through 6. And so follow along with me because then we're going to be discussing these principles here. Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh, And said, my father, my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all of their possessions have come from the land of Canaan. And indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? They said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we as also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks. For the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know of any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. And I want to supplement what we just read with some words from the Pen of Inspiration through Patriarchs and Prophets, page 233, to give us a little bit of context here. Joseph took five of his brothers to present to the Pharaoh and receive from him the grant of the land for their future home. Gratitude to his prime minister would have led the monarch to honor them with appointments to offices of state. But Joseph, and this is so key here, but Joseph, true to the worship of Jehovah, sought to save his brothers from the temptations that they would have been exposed to at a heathen court. Therefore, he counseled them. When questioned by the king to tell him, frankly, their occupation, he abided by that. So the important point here is when we look at the spiritual and the spiritual principles and truths is first that Joseph wanted to be true to the worship of God. He wanted to be true. And secondly, his love 
in saving his brothers from temptations, from the influences that would be exposed to, that they would be exposed to in the heathen courts of uh, Pharaoh's court. So what other spiritual lessons can be learned from these verses? What about humbleness? What about humility and honesty? To admit to being a shepherd in Egypt, as Mary had mentioned, it's an abomination. It's the lowest of the low positions. Yet before Pharaoh, they frankly told him honestly what they were. Not only themselves, but what their fathers were as well. So that really embraces the humbleness, the humility, and the honesty that we're looking at. What was the result of this humbleness, humility, and honesty? Well, Jacob, Joseph's brothers, were awarded the best country in the land to dwell in. And Pharaoh, in turn, appoints the most skilled of those men among them to be the chief herdsman over his livestock as well. I think God was blessing them. Amen. There was a turn in their hearts and a turn in their characters, and God was blessing them. So now continuing forward to the next few verses. Again, this is Genesis 47, verses 7 through 10. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of my life with my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. This is really important here because Joseph brought his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh and blessed him. So in the Hebrew lexicon, the phrase to set him before, the word is amad, to present one before the king. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and the Hebrew word for this is barach. And barach in the Hebrew lexicon, it's meant as a salutation by invoking a blessing on someone for another's welfare. And it can be used either for one coming into someone's present presence or leaving someone's presence. And Jacob did both in gratitude to Pharaoh. And in Ellen White's um, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 169, you could also find it in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 153. She states, Joseph brought Jacob before Pharaoh and introduced his much-honored father to the king. Jacob blessed Pharaoh for his kindness to his son Joseph. So what's the spiritual lesson here that we're learning? Other than humbleness, humility, and honesty is kindness. Kindness. Shouldn't we all be doing the same thing to anybody who treats one of our loved ones with such kindness and respect? Let me ask you this. How do you think a blessing of gratitude to God might be received by that person who was acting in kindness? I remember Pastor Riccio, Rico, sorry, Pastor Rico. He used a phrase, an attitude of gratitude. And Jacob certainly exhibited his attitude of gratitude by the growth in his faith and a gratitude towards God. And this was made manifest in his expression of gratitude to Pharaoh by blessing him as he came in and as he left his presence. And I pray that our walk with the Lord manifest those same characters, those same character changes in our lives as it did in Jacob's. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Greg. What, sure. what, a, what an amazing, an amazing lesson, that, that lesson yeah. was, that journey. Yeah. This is not about profession. This is not about no. studies or, or anything else. This is about reflecting God's character on Amen. our journey. Amen. Amen. And this is really what, what Joseph was concerned with yeah. and how much he really wanted the brothers to do the same. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, on Tuesday's lesson, we're talking about Jacob blessings, uh, blessing Jason, uh, Joseph's sons. And, um, and this is an incredible picture 
of um, how God prepares a people in the nation with these blessings. Amen. So as Jacob approaches death, he remembers his early return to Bethel, and I'm sure that was permanent in his mind. Bethel was a significant part of his journey mm -hmm. as, as a person. He remembers the promises God made to him and the commitments he made to God as he built an altar and worshiped God right there in Bethel. As he senses Joseph approaching as he was probably lying down and maybe in anguish, he tells Joseph of the renewed promise, a promise of the everlasting possession he received from God. And here's what he told Joseph. We read in Genesis chapter 48, verses 3 and 4. Ge Genesis 48, 3 and 4. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Bethel in the land of Canaan and blessed me. Verse 4. And he said to me, Behold, Jacob, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. By the way, this is an incredible promise. And so Joseph, I mean, Jacob is really talking to, to his son and saying, this is what happened, and I want you to be aware of that. So by the way, this is the same promise that God made and gave Abraham, as we read in Genesis chapter 17, verses 8. I'm not going to, to read that, but it's exactly the same promise. So the hope of the promised land as a comforting thought that nurtures Jacob's hope as he feels death coming is real. He is, he is at, he's dying, and he's concerned about the promises made, and he's saying, I may be dying here, but God's word will ultimately be fulfilled. So then Jacob turns to Joseph's two sons, who were both born in Egypt, and blessed them. But he does so in the context of the future promise regarding his own seed, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's, his own seed. So Joseph's two sons, Manasseh, or Manasseh, and Ephraim, are the only grandsons that Jacob blessed. In blessing Manasseh and Ephraim, these two grandsons are elevated from the status of grandsons of Jacob to sons of Jacob. Significant. Here is how Jacob tells Joseph, Genesis chapter 48, Five. And now your two sons, this is Jacob talking to, to Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of, G of Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. So Joseph is really blessing and upgrading two grandsons into his own sonship. Notice that in the verse we've just read, Jacob places the younger son Ephraim before the older Manasseh. Jacob's blessing seems to imply a, pre, a preeminence of the second son over the first son. Just a, very much like the position that him and his brother had. Yet Joseph is also present, by the way. So Joseph is with the kids and with his dad. And Jacob's, uh, J and Jacob's blessing essentially concerns Joseph. Here is how Scripture records it. Uh, chapter 48, verses 15 and 16 of Je Genesis, and it reads as follows. And Jacob blessed Joseph and said... God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, verse 16, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them 
and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And the picture that is presented through the, through the spirit of prophecy is that they were together and they were embracing each other. And so through Manasseh, Manasseh and of course um, through his younger brother, it reached to Joseph and he was blessing Joseph while he was blessing the kids. What we see in this, in this ceremony, in this blessing, is a personal testimony about God's faithfulness to them in the past and his belief in God's promise for them in the future. You see, Jacob refers to God of Abraham and Isaac because the God of Abraham and Isaac is a God who provided food and protected, and protected them. This is a God who has redeemed Jacob from all evil, as we read in Genesis chapter 48, verse 16. This is a God of Bethel, uh, of, of Bethel who told Joseph in, in Genesis 31, 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. This is the God with whom Jacob had wrestled. And in Genesis 32, 29, 30, we read, Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is, why is that that you ask? My name, answered the Lord. And Jacob, and of course the Lord blessed him there. And so Jacob in verses uh, 30, and we read, And so Jacob called the name of, of the place Penil, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And this is the God who changed Jacob's name to Israel. So we, we see, in, uh, and uh, as we read in Genesis chapter 32, verses 26, 20, 28, we read that, And God said, Let me go, for the day breaks, after they had been wrestling for a full day, and for a full, a full night. But uh, Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me, verses 27. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And God said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with man, and you have prevailed. By recalling all these experiences where God turns the evil into good, Jacob expresses his hope. He is dying, but he's expressing his hope. That, that God hoped that God will take care of the lives of his grandsons just as he cared for his own life and that of Joseph's. And that in the future, God will also take care of his descendants when they eventually return to Canaan. You see, this hope of a return to the promised land is very clear and evident as, Jacob, uh, as Jacob tells Joseph in Genesis chapter 48, 48, verses 21 and 22, Behold, I'm dying. This is father to son. Behold, I'm dying, Joseph, but God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. Moreover, says him to Joseph, I have given you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the end of the Amorite with my sword and my, and my bow. Jacob is referring to Shechem, a place of land that he acquired, but also a place where Joseph's bones will be buried and where the land will be distributed to the tribes of Israel. This hope, this hope of a return to the promised land, is very much in Jacob's mind because of the promises God made, God made to Jacob when he told him in Genesis chapter 12, verses 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Was this promise fulfilled? The Apostle Peter makes it quite clear in Acts chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, that this promise was fulfilled through Jesus, whom God sent to bless us. 
And in those verses we read, You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with Abraham. And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. What a promise. What a father. He was not in Canaan, but he believed in God. Amen. Amen. Mary, Jacob blesses his sons. What is the spiritual significance of these blessings? Mm, we're going to unpack that here. We're going to continue Jacob's story in Genesis 49, verses 1 to 28. So this passage records the blessings Jacob bestowed upon each of his sons before he died. It begins with, and Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. So Jacob proceeds to bless his sons in birth order, starting with Reuben the eldest in verse 3 to Benjamin the youngest in verse 27. So in the essence of time, we won't read the entire passage, but instead we'll review a few key verses related to some of his specific sons. And I'd like to begin with a quote from the book, Spiritual Gifts. As Jacob was about to die, his children gathered about him to receive his blessing and to listen to his last words of advice to them. As he spoke with his children for the last time, the spirit of the Lord rested upon him and he uttered prophecies concerning them which reached far into the future. While under the spirit of inspiration, he laid open before them their past life and their future history, revealing the purposes of God in regard to them. He showed them that God would by no means sanction cruelty or wickedness. He commenced with the eldest. Although Reuben had no hand in selling Joseph, yet previous to that transaction, he had grievously sinned. His course was corrupt, for he had transgressed the law of God. Jacob uttered his prophecy in regard to him in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 49. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Thus the father pictured what should have been the position of Reuben as the firstborn son, but his sin at Edar had made him unworthy of the birthright blessing. What was Reuben's grievous sin at Edar? He had slept with Bilhah, one of his father's concubines. That's in Genesis 35, 22. So because of that sin, he was unworthy of the birthright blessing. Verse 4 continues. Jacob says, unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Jacob then prophesied in regard to Simeon and Levi, who practiced deception to the Shechemites, and then in a most cruel, revengeful manner destroyed them. They were also the ones who were the most guilty in the case of Joseph and selling him. Verses 5 to 7 say, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dug down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Ellen White continues, at the numbering of Israel, just before their entrance to Canaan, Simeon was the smallest tribe. And Moses, in his last blessing, made no reference to Simeon. Levi also received no inheritance except 48 cities scattered in different parts of the land. In the case of this tribe, however, their fidelity to Jehovah 
when the other tribes apostatized, secured their appointment to the sacred service of the sanctuary, and thus the curse was changed to a blessing. Jacob thus uttered the words of inspiration to his sorrowing sons, presenting before them the light in which God viewed their deeds of violence and that he would visit them for their sins. His prophetic words in regard to his other sons were not as gloomy. And the double portion of the inheritance, as we just heard from Victor, he gave to Joseph. The crowning blessings of the birthright were transferred to Judah. The significance of his name denotes praise. And it's enfolded in the prophetic history of this tribe. His prophetic eye looked hundreds of years in the future to the birth of Christ. And he said in verses 8 to 10, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the gathering of the people. The lion, king of the forest, is a fitting symbol of this tribe, from which came David and the son of David, Shiloh. Jesus Christ, the true lion of the tribe of Judah, to whom all powers shall finally bow and all nations render homage. For most of his children, Jake foretold a prosperous future. The words he uttered to his children were not his, spoken because he had retained an unforgiving spirit on account of their wrongs. He had forgiven them. He had loved them to the last, God, by the spirit of prophecy, elevated the mind of Jacob above his natural feelings. In his last hours, angels were all around him, and the power of the grace of God shone upon him. His paternal feelings would have led him to only utter in his dying testimony expressions of love and tenderness. But under the influence of inspiration, he uttered truth although it was painful. So in conclusion, these blessings are prophecies that predict the future of each of them. They refer to the immediate history of the tribes of Israel, but also refer to the Messiah and the ultimate hope of salvation. These are not predestined fates, as if God willed or predetermined what each of these would act out but rather they are expressions of what their own characters and the characters of their children would bring about. As we saw in the case of Levi's descendants, despite the curse pronounced upon Levi, each person still had freedom to choose what they would do with their lives, and the curse was changed to a blessing because of their choice to be faithful to God. So the blessing of Israel has a universal scope. As we stand on the brink of Christ's second coming, may we stay so connected to him that we're ever striving to choose faithfulness to God in everything. Amen. So much. The, the patriarch, truthfully a prophet, connected to God. Amen. 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 So Greg... Um, that is hope of the promised land, isn't there? Amen. Praise God for that. So Thursday's lesson is titled The Hope of the Promised Land, and it covers Genesis chapters 49 and 50. And the conclusion of Genesis is really made up of three primary events that represent three principal lessons God is trying to teach each of us, and each are filled with hope. And I think it's so important because as we go through scripture, it's not just to read about history. It's, there's documentation, yes. But we have to ask ourselves, Lord, what are you trying to teach us? What principles do you want us to understand and to really grasp and to, with the power of the Holy Spirit, to apply in our lives? So let's keep that in mind as we begin to look at 
these three events. The first, let's read Genesis chapter 49, verses 29 through 31. Then he charged them and, and said to them, and this is um, Jacob, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, and they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife, and there I buried Leah. What about, where was Rachel buried? She didn't, she was buried elsewhere. elsewhere. She didn't make it back there. Okay, so. Here, Jacob is telling his sons to bring him back to the land of Canaan, to bury him in the tomb of his forefathers. Now, let's read Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 and 25. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So this request by Joseph is stated a little differently than Jacob's request in that Joseph wasn't requesting an immediate burial, so to speak, um, but states God will surely visit you and you shall carry my bones from here, carry up my bones from here, clearly pointing to their, the uh, exodus from Egypt. And you could look at that in in Exodus 13, 19. But both descriptions of Jacob's and Joseph's deaths and burials are events pointing toward the hope of returning to the promised land. Not only literally for themselves, they wanted to be buried there. That's who they were. That's where the Lord had promised them that this is the promised land that you will be in. But it also pointed forward eventually again to their exodus from Egypt and their returning back to the promised land of Canaan. This was Israel's hope then, but this also foreshadows hope for us today in returning with Jesus to the heavenly kingdom of God and ultimately to to the new earth made new, the true promised land. This is our hope for today. Let's take a look at the second event. Let's read Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. I know it's going to sound a little bit long. It's six verses, but bear with me because there's some real important lessons here that we need to understand when we're talking about the hope of the promised land. So let's begin in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father's that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went down and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? In other words, don't bow down to me, but don't be afraid. That's what he's trying to communicate with them. But as for you, yes, you you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So this section, it really speaks to all of us about confession, repentance, and forgiveness. The principal lesson here is God will always turn evil to good if there is confession and repentance on the one side of the offender and forgiveness on the other side of who has offended or who was offended. This is, it's so important. It's so crucial to our understanding of God's principles and the principle of hope in returning to the promised land. God tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness, not some, not your least bit of unrighteousness, 
righteousness, but all your unrighteousness. What a beautiful passage. So this is an example of really what Joseph's brothers did when they confessed their sins. They admitted their guilt against Joseph. And Joseph, how does he respond? In loving kindness and forgiveness. Matthew tells us straightforward the importance of forgiveness in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. For if you forgive men and their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men and their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So these are key principles we need to understand and take to heart. And they can really only be accomplished in us by the working of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. We in our own human nature are not capable of doing that. Many times, as we know, it's difficult for us. Just imagine your own lives. It's difficult for us in our fallen nature to admit our guilt sometimes, to confess our sins to those who we've offended, and to God because of pride. Even though God already knows our sins, If we are willing, he wants to help change and restore our hearts and our minds. But we must be willing to allow him to come in and to change us. But we can only do this if we allow the Lord to work in us through the power of the Holy Spirit and change our hearts and minds from our fallen human nature and worldly standards that we have to his heavenly standards. And this is also true when it comes to forgiveness. In life, it's sometimes very difficult for us to forgive someone who has deeply hurt us or offended us, like in Joseph's case. And can you imagine if it were you in that situation where you had the brothers that sold him out? How willing were you or I be, how, how willing would you or I be to forgive him? That would be so hard to do. But in these situations, once again, we need to be willing to let the Lord work within us from our hearts and to change us, and to change our minds and hearts to be in line with his. And the third, the last one, has to do with salvation. And this is the ultimate reaching the promised land here. So let's read Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 and 25. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying But God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. Okay, so these last verses of Genesis have a deeper meaning other than just Joseph's death. It points to, as we had mentioned earlier, it points to Israel's exodus from Egypt back to the promised land of Canaan, but ultimately, Ultimately, it points forward to the promise of Jesus' second coming and taking us home to the true promised land. We mentioned that earlier, but keep in mind the hope of our salvation is made certain by the death, resurrection, and heavenly ministry of Jesus for us today. Praise God for not only giving us hope, he also assures us with the promise of bringing us home to the true promised land through Jesus Christ, to be with him, to be with the Father, and to be with our loved ones. And take comfort in this last verse, John 14, verses 1 through 4. Not Maybe not a last verse, but last couple verses. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And and the way you know. So this is the great hope that we have. And praise God for his love for us that he gives us this hope in reaching the promised land in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Any final thoughts? I do have a final thought. Final thought is um, we all through life experience very difficult times. So we all have holes in our hearts. But praise God, he fills those holes with hope. That is what the Lord inspired my wife. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Greg. Thank you so much, Mary. 
It's really been wonderful to be with you today and really talk about an incredible promise, a yeah. promise that God has made to each one of us yes. through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob Amen. and Joseph and throughout Scripture. As, as I... As I want to make an appeal to you, I, I want to really bring this, this interesting uh, concept to, to your minds and your thoughts today. I don't know if you notice, but the book of Genesis ends the same way in which the old Pentateuch ends. And, and the last book, the last of the five books that make up the Pentateuch is Deuteronomy. It ends with death. The death of Joseph in Genesis, Jacob, jo jo uh, Joseph, and the death of Moses in Deuteronomy, chapter 34, chapter 50, chapter 30, 50 of, jo of Genesis, 34 of Deuteronomy. And yet, it is death without a visible grave, particularly in the case of Moses. Mm. You know, the Bible tells us yeah. in Deuteronomy, uh, Chapter 34, verse 6, And God buried Moses in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows to this day where that grave is. And you know, and, and it is death in the perspective of, it is death that, that is revealed through these patriarchs and Moses. Um, that have a perspective of a, pre a, a promised land that is so real mm -hmm. as these men are dying. Yes. You see, in the case of Moses, and I am specifically mentioning this because I want you to really understand how significant it is. In the case of Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 and 4, tells us that Moses went up from the plain of Moab to Mount Nebo. He was going up knowing that he was going to die. God had told him that beforehand. To the top of Pisgah, Mount Pisgah, which is across from Jericho, the city of Palms, by the way. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan. That's one of the sons of Jacob. As far as Dan... All Naphtali, a son of Jacob, through Joseph, and Japheth, and the land of Ephraim, son of Jacob, of, of, uh, of Jacob through Joseph, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, verse 3, the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, which is the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar, and then verse 4. Then the Lord said to him, to Moses, this is the Lord of which I swore to give Abraham. This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, to give it to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Why am I bringing this into a discussion? Moses believed in the promises that God had made. Amen. Moses knew that it was time for him to rest from his work for the Lord had chosen to tell him. But because of his faithfulness, God showed him not only the pr in, in, in real, in real how, how the promise that he had made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to Joseph, would be fulfilled. And he sees it in vision, miles and miles apart, from a hillside, from a mountainside. But Moses goes to death knowing that God's promise is fulfilled Amen. and Amen. will be fulfilled. Amen. You know, the book of Genesis, similarly to the entire Pentateuch begins with creation and the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and ends with the prospect of the promised land and the hope of resurrection of the dead Amen. in Deuteronomy chapter 
uh, chapter 34, 6, as we read. This coincidence is not accidental. This pattern of association appears in the total structure of the entire Bible. The first pages of the Bible speak of creation, Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And the last pages of the Bible speak of the hope of the coming king, the hope of the Lord, the hope of salvation. Revelation 21 verses 1 and 5, Revelation 22 verses 20. And in Revelation 21 verses 1 and 5, and I'm not going to read it all because you should know it almost by heart, and that is, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. John was gifted with an incredible, incredible vision of a fulfillment of the promise Amen. of God. And then in Revelation 22, 20, we read, he who testifies to these things says, and who testifies to these things? Jesus. So Jesus says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. The reality is that you and I, all of us, we are all in, in a pilgrimage toward the promised land, the new Jerusalem. By faith, we need to believe God. By faith, we need to trust Him completely. We also need to love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. This will ensure that we will keep our focus on the eternal. I'm almost, I'm almost done. The Apostle Paul encourages us to walk every day our pilgrimage by faith. Amen. Amen. And he tells us in Hebrews 11.1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. And so what does he mean by that? See, the coming of Christ, my salvation and your salvation, redemption, restoration, and eternal life with him, and the promised land in the new Jerusalem is really the substance of what constitutes faith. But he says, faith is the evidence of things to sin also. Two pillars in which faith stands. Substance of things hoped for yeah. and the evidence of things not seen. Amen. We need to believe in God and in his promises to the point where our physical, our mental, and our spiritual energy testifies daily to the existence of God and his supreme power in guiding us to the promised land. Amen. Amen. And so my prayer to you and to me every day is that just as we've read through the, through the lives of Joseph, the lives of Jacob, the lives of Isaac and Abraham, and Moses for that matter, that we live by faith, Yes. We trust Him as if we are today in the midst of God journeying to its, towards His promised land. Let's pray. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank You so much for Scripture, for the Bible, Amen. for the book of Genesis. And Lord, Genesis is the Bible in microcosm. And Lord, what a wonderful book for us to understand your love, understand your purpose for each one of us, yes. and for us to embrace and live by every day. Amen. I want to thank you, Father, for being the God of renewals, for providing salvation through that horrible death on the cross here on earth. Amen. And I want to thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, while we await your return, and through the Scripture that has been written, we can gain the courage, the belief, and the faith to walk daily toward the goal, which is to meet you very soon one day. 
and occupy with you that new land, that new city, that new Jerusalem that was built for us, and eventually live with you eternally in a new world that will be renewed and created for each one of us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, not only for your blessings, but for the assurance of salvation and an eternity with you. Amen. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, Happy Sabbath. everyone. Happy Sabbath, folks.